You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a, a reading of a Collected Works, Volume 314 by Rudolf Steiner. It's the last lecture in the third part, numbered Lecture 12 in the entire book, given in Dornach on the 2nd of January, 1924. The book is called Physiology and Healing, Treatment, Therapy, and Hygiene. Today I would like to deal with some of the questions put to me, some of which I deem to be particularly important. One concerns gonorrhea, the clap. To see what needs to be done, we must study the nature of the matter. It seems to me that people are too easily satisfied, particularly in this area, simply saying it is infection, infection, and once more, infection. This is what people really say. The possibility of infection is, of course, extraordinarily great with this and similar conditions. But knowing about the infection is least likely to lead to knowledge of the medicinal agents. It does not help much to know that the condition is infectious. The only thing is that you do, of course, ensure that the risk of infection is reduced. That is a matter of course, really. But it will be good to go into things like this more deeply. Well, we have to understand that the human organism truly is a system complete in itself, and that everything outside it is, to a greater or lesser degree, poison to it. Everything outside the human organism really is poison to it. But there are certain adaptations where an otherwise toxic effect is isolated. This isolation of what is otherwise the action of a poison brings about the realization of etheric impulses and astral impulses when female and male seed unite. It also comes into play in numerous other cases but especially when female and male seed unite. The action is eminently toxic when the two substances, which are polar opposites, come together. It is isolated, however, and in that isolation, exposed to the powers of the cosmos, powers that can actually be described in detail. These are the concentrated powers of sun and moon, and the outcome of the unification is exposed to them. Such exposure is only possible when male and female seed actually interact. With every substance that is outside the female seed, that is, produced in organs that are not the female sexual organs, the male seed produces a poison which has no use anywhere in the human organism, nor anywhere in the world outside. Conversely, the female seed produces a poison with every substance, except the one secreted by the male sexual organ, a poison that cannot be processed. This poison essentially, but in metamorphosed form, is canker poison on the one occasion, clap poison on the other. We are therefore dealing with diseases that are something greatly different from the syphilitic conditions we have been considering. We are dealing with the production of toxins that do not stand up to exposure in the human organism, nor beyond the human organism. Such substances are essentially also tremendously powerful infectious agents. They are altogether vehicles for parasites of the smallest kind, hypermicroscopic organisms. This is the kind of effect we are dealing with, with the astral and etheric organization in the male and female interacting and producing these toxins by acting down into the physical. That is the essence of it. The risk of infection is secondary. It always exists, particularly because this is the way in which the altogether most powerful toxins that exist for the organ are produced. I think it is extraordinarily important to gain insight into such things so that we won't always really, I'd say, consider the relevant phenomena in the way in which the whole of human reproduction was regarded at one time, by tracing the whole human race back to Eve's ovaries for all of Earth's future. 
That is, of course, an easy way of looking at it. And people also take the easy way when they say, this disease is due to infection, infection in its turn due to infection. And they get back, of course, into something indefinite, gaining no real insight. But when we gain the kind of insight I have just been referring to, we will, of course, ask ourselves the following. We will say, how can we deal with the activity which arises in the human organism under the influence of this poison? We have to produce something to which this poison may be exposed. Just as one can expose the fertilized female seed to the universe, for instance. We have to create an atmosphere, as it were, in the astral and etheric organism that has some capacity for absorption. Not of the poison, however, for this will be eliminated when the poison-producing powers in the astral and etheric are absorbed. With things like this in particular, it is often the case that you get healing powers to to come in from two sides. You will really be able to bring about something good in such a case if you give a preparation such as an alkali carbonate by mouth and apply compresses locally, strong oily eucalyptus compresses, letting the two things act together. This will definitely lead to a cure, slowly but all the more thoroughly. For essentially the action of alkali carbonates is that they produce a special ether body, as it were, from the whole human ether body. The eucalyptus extract then flows through this manufactured ether tract in an astral-like way. You literally create an atmosphere around the genital tract which absorbs the poison-producing powers. This is what one may consider in such a case. Are there any comments, perhaps? All these things are not really for discussion. They have to be tried out and will prove their value. I'd now like to consider a question I found here. It is this, and he reads a question. Can a patient who has become addicted to morphine because of severe asthma be got off the drugs, including morphine, by treating him with the agents used at the Institute of Clinical Medicine in Stuttgart, citric acid, prunus spinosa, and nicotiana tabacum, Steiner again. Asthma is a problem because essentially it is due to the fact that exhalation, the stream of exhalation, meets with resistance in the respiratory tract. It catches there, as it were. It is something which one can see very strongly in the astral organism. It is, of course, always somewhat problematical to put these things on record. But you are You are, all of you, anthroposophists and will, of course, take these things as they are meant to be taken. You actually see something like hooks facing the outgoing airflow and it runs into them. See plate 6? That is the status. It shows that asthma is quite specifically the condition which is right on the border to purely mental conditions. I do not mean the so-called mental diseases, but conditions connected with the life of the psyche. Mental diseases need not at all be connected with the life of the psyche, but may merely be physical conditions, with a mental aspect merely a symptom. In most cases they should not be called mental diseases, for it is almost always an organic disease with its mental counter-image, a shadow image which is merely a symptom. The best way of curing the so-called mental diseases is to consider the physical status as a syndrome which may be renal disease, liver disease, or a truly organic disease of the brain. For me, real mental diseases are those where you have truly mental causes, such as shock or anxiety, and the like. With asthma, the situation is that we must often go a very long way back for the mental causes. When you have reached my age, you have come across all kinds of different types of asthma. I have to say that in cases of asthma, looking for the cause and origin, leaving aside the karmic aspects, you often have to go back as far as embryonic life. The external causes truly do often lie in embryonic life. The mother will have suffered shocks or worries that would have come up again and again at irregular intervals during the pregnancy. 
Such things have an extraordinarily powerful effect on the whole system of mucous membranes in the respiratory tract. And this establishes the causes for something which will later show itself in the phenomena of asthma. The following is particularly important with those phenomena. Asthma takes very different forms, depending on the person's individual nature, and much depends on our ability truly to combat the other sequels of asthma in the organism. This makes the organism strong enough so that it can do something itself to combat the asthma later on. Let me now refer to the possibilities for dealing with the situation which truly is an irregular movement of the astral body in the region of bronchi and lungs. There is something behind it which I'd say is really cunning, just as asthma is a really cunning disease. If you examine someone suffering from asthma using occult vision, if I may be permitted to say so, you will find that something which I'd like to call the organism's inner appetite has been cut out. Let us first of all consider the concept of the, quote, inner appetite of the organism, close quote. You really only arrive at this when you observe very young children. They taste things not only with their tongue. I've always said so to teachers. Young children taste things not only with their tongue, they taste things with the whole of their organism. The whole organism is something like a subtle taste organ. Later this becomes localized around the palate, tongue, and so on. This differentiation, which comes relatively early, is only partial, however. In subconscious spheres, human beings taste things and thus generate this inner experience of appetite throughout the whole organism. The whole organism simply has that power to strive, which we call appetite. Well, you know, just as there is such a thing as lack of appetite in the separate head region, so there is also lack of appetite in the organism, and that is very much the case with asthma. There, the whole organism lacks appetite. It does not at all feel like taking up the ingested nutrients, especially the parts that end up in the circulation as a whole. It even has a distaste, though it is not aware of this, since it is inwardly unconscious, especially for cooked food. It is fairly easy to observe this in the outer symptoms in the asthmatic's life. This needs to be dealt with first of all. We have to make the organism able to have an appetite again. It is altogether a good thing for you to know how to deal with an organism where you think you notice lack of appetite, with the proper connection between ether organism and astral organism disrupted, for that is what it means to be without appetite. It is a good thing to know quite generally what will benefit in that case, and it is always good to introduce into the organism, in the right dosage, the tannic acid to be gained from sage leaves, for example, from nut leaves, from oak or willow bark. In short, if you present the human organism with tannic acid in perhaps the first decimal, that is, just a percentage. This is particularly important for the astral body in such a case. It is stimulated to extend its activity to the ether body when given tannic acid. The ether body on its part does not react to this. We merely create chaos if we give only tannic acid. We therefore have to help the ether body as well. This is done by making an extract of the leaves of Veronica officinalis, heath speedwell, and obtaining above all the bitter principles from this the bitter principles found in such plants, they can also be obtained from other plants, any that contain such bitter principles, are given in alternation, let us say, the one in the morning, the other at night. With this we can regulate the rhythm between astral and etheric body and so initiate healing. If you then instruct the patient to be truly patient and not lie in bed for weeks but sleep in a chair, and to try and meditate on his breathing when going to sleep, that is, mentally to see or feel, inhalation, spread the breath out, then exhalation, breathing very consciously on going to sleep, and on waking up immediately start again to breathe consciously for some minutes, 
If you strengthen his moral powers, applying them to his own organism, his breathing, his breathing, but so that he is able to use them undeterred, it will be quite impossible for the patient to do this consistently in any other position except for sleeping in a chair, that is, especially not lying down, and you make this the third act in the treatment, there is hope of dealing with asthma, even at very late stages of its development. Addiction to morphine is merely a sequel, and we must then deal with it. We must then try and combat the addiction. Now, to another interesting case put before me. I would stress, however, that one tends to produce things that are more or less problematical when one does not actually see the patient. We can only construe the case in theory. But let us briefly consider the situation of a post office secretary who has had a nervous breakdown from some cause or other. At first, it seems, he was sleepless and got himself into a situation where he lost control of himself, thinking only with his head, which means automatically. That was probably the first stage. It seems that it then turned into something else, with a tremor developing in the limbs after two years and spasms, probably also in the limbs. In such a case, we must above all know that the whole condition is not located in organs other than those which, out of the I capital organization and the astral organization, give direction to the human will system. The will system must be considered. The irregular and abnormal element in the will system is indeed involved in this strange way of being given up to cerebral automatism. It has nothing to do with the thoughts. It has to do with the will that lies behind the development of a thought. Everything goes in the direction of being active deep down in the subconscious mind to generate the will really only in the organism of metabolism and limbs, withdrawing it from the rhythmic organism, withdrawing it from the neurosensory organism. The tendency is really to shift all physical and etheric organs of will down toward the lower organism. I'm sure you could have seen this very well also in external symptoms if you'd had opportunity, let us say, to observe the post office secretary from some point in time and then again two years later. You would notice that the mutual relationship between lower and upper lip had changed in those two years. Two years earlier, it would have seemed to you that there may have been a particular, not entirely harmonious relationship in moving the upper lip relative to the lower lip. You'd have the feeling that it does not fit together as in normal people, and this would have been more so after two years. The lower lip would have continued its unruly movements more than the upper lip. You will be able to observe such things. You will also be able to observe the relationship between leg and arm movements that are not in tune. In a case like this, we need to combine medical treatment, meaning physical treatment, and treatment of the psyche in eurythmy therapy. These two things must be combined, and the case is indeed typical for this. Given equisetum baths in such a case, using relatively much equisetum, which means that you are counting on the silica, equisetum contains a very high percentage of silica. Give equisetum baths, therefore and you'll be able to strengthen the eye organization quite considerably. But it needs the influence of the bath. There is always the risk of the effect being lost again after a short time. It is encouraged toward a tendency to be lasting if you now have vowels done in eurythmy therapy, simply vowels, for one hour after the bath. You are then stimulating something for which the equisetum bath has provided the basis. You may thus hope to combat the matter, doing so mainly from the periphery. We must always try and find the point from which we can combat things. Here is another case I have been finding most interesting. It is just that it is not very clearly presented. It says here, Lupus-type proliferation of mucosa in the palate, spreading progressively, causes problems swallowing for a woman aged 37. She had pulmonary tuberculosis seven years ago, second or third degree, but there are largely adhesions now. Surgery for
for non-existent gallstones. Steiner again. I would like to know what happened immediately after the operation for non-existent gallstones. And there's a report. Suffers from disorders of the digestive tract, flatulence responding to the S exercise in eurythmic therapy, and now minimal. Has had serious worries for years. Might a successful I exercise have caused the lupus? What would need to be done? Steiner again. Do you think that is... It really is something like lupus. A uh, person says again, It might be scurvy, but it does not look like it. Steiner again, We need not assume that. In reality, it can really only be that the form-giving power of the etheric organism is simply not acting sufficiently strongly in the peripheral parts. It cannot be anything else. And we'd have to deal with it simply by injecting B venom in perhaps the sixth decimal, making the process a total one, which happens because the B venom stimulates the etheric body most powerfully to take up the astral powers truly into the whole organism, excuse me, into the whole human organism. B venom is a most interesting substance. At the base of it is a system of forces that truly is also the basis for the whole form of the human organism. The influence at work in the hive between production of bee venom and the bee food and everything the bee gathers, what will then be the wax cells in the honeycomb, is not for the individual bee, but for the whole hive, and marvelously similar to the organic processes in the human organism. For if we study bees from the point where they land on the flowers, to the point where they return to the hive, secrete the products they have gathered, and then build the cells, we have an activity of the hide which truly is inwardly, in terms of the capital I, the astral and the etheric, highly similar to what happens between the processes that occur inwardly in the brain when human beings have sensory perceptions, then take substances into their powers of perception, and all the way to the process of configuration, that strange configuration of bone cells. In the honeycombs we see something that has stayed soft, different from the activity that has led to bone cells, and we see human sensory perception in the way the bee sits on the flower. The whole human organism is indeed encompassed in what comes between the sucking process when bees are on the flower and the process of producing the wax cells. Bee venom is the organizing principle behind it all, coming in from the spiritual sphere. So if you are able to see that the organic activity breaks off, as it were, in the periphery, does not want to enter into the periphery, then you can do much good with bee or wasp venom, and also support the action of the injection from within by making a thin paste of honey and milk, which you give daily as a dietary supplement. This is something where we can really see how the organism, which has contracted in spasm and showed such abnormal phenomena in different areas in the periphery, is spreading its activity out again on the one hand, under the influence of the insect venom, which enters into the circulatory system, and on the other, under the influence of something which is related to milk and honey as a substance in the organization, developing and spreading. I think this is what one may recommend in such a case. I would now like to talk about the issue which it seems is also close to your hearts. It is the matter of neuropathies, spinal cord disorders, and so on. Among neurological disorders, those of the spinal cord are, of course, hardest to reach. Others can be dealt with more easily. But we would be able to deal with so-called neurological disorders much more easily if we considered that the nerve, the nerve strand, the nerve altogether, contains a substance which always tends to crumble and break up. Unlike other parts of the organism, Nerves contain no upbuilding, sprouting powers of growth. Nerves everywhere contain matter tending toward the eye organization 
in always wanting, excuse me, in always really wanting to separate off and crumble. The moment the eye organization is not strong enough to prevent the nerve from crumbling, all kinds of phenomena develop. Depending on whether it is the eye organization or the astral organization which is not strong enough, you get either the neurological disorders as such, where the astral organization is not strong enough, or the different conditions with half mental symptoms and so on, where the eye organization is not strong enough. You have to understand that it is possible to influence the nervous system so that a kind of phantom of the astral and the eye organism arises in it. This really happens if you attempt to get powers of silica action into the whole nervous system. For a severe neurological disorder, not a partial one, this is like a postulate, as it were, to get silica into the nerve organization. Unless there are special obstacles and inhibitions, we get silica into the nervous system because there truly is an extraordinarily great affinity of the form of the human nervous system to the arnica substance. It truly is very great. And if you give injections of arnica in a high potency, the 15th, 25th or even 30th potency, you will find that in most cases the effect of arnica injections is that patients feel themselves the urge and drive to do something for their nervous disorder. For this must always be our aim, to have the patient suddenly realize a medicine is relieving me of the problem in the nerves and I am now able to use my eye organization, my astral organization. It is the taking over, relieving, which matters in this case. In neurological patients, eye organism and astral organism are intensely involved in the nerve process. We have to introduce something into the nerve process which imitates eye organization and astral organization. The remarkable configuration which exists in Arnica does exactly that. It is a compound mixture of all kinds of things, truly also a kind of microcosmic imitation of all kinds of macrocosmic elements. Arnica substance does this to a particularly great degree. Just consider everything that is going on. First we have the silica contained in Arnica montana. It is the base material. It is tremendously sensitive, a deeply significant reagent for all kinds of cosmic influences. Silica is an uncommonly subtle reagent to everything that influences the earth. Arnica montana always has a tendency to transmit these subtle silica in quotes perceptions, as we might call them, of the cosmos and give them form in the potassium salts and the calcium salts, which are likewise distributed in a marvelous way in the plant. Think of the whole action of tannic acid as I described it. This action on the astral organism is also present in the arnica plant. We thus take something brought in from the cosmos, configurations imprinted, as it were, in the potassium and calcium salts, directly into the organism with the tannin contained in arnica. At the same time, arnica substance miraculously, excuse me, miraculously develops a sedative action so that the human being does not feel disquiet as foreign matter enters into the physical correlate of the astral body. Arnica substance has something camphor-like in it, with, and thus its own sedative. It also contains protein, marvelously embedded in latex and similar material, which means affinity to the ether body. We also have phosphorus-like principles in its volatile oils. The whole is constructed in such a way that it turns directly into a phantom of the human eye organism. If you therefore introduce Arnica Montana substance into the organism in the right dosage, by injection, the other things will not act as powerfully given by injection, you will as a rule find that at least initially there is a powerful effect on the nervous system. Things will be going the right way when you are able to note that the patient feels stronger now and believes he can now cope with the situation himself.
This is the feeling we must evoke. If it does not develop, alternate, alternate something with the Arnica Montana that will help to support him by getting the Arnica action going also from the respiratory side. Alternate Arnica with formic acid injections in relatively high percentage. You will see that the matter will then arise. If you do not achieve this, it will of course be necessary to make an extract of the corresponding part of an animal's nervous system, depending on whether the origin of the disease is in the brain or the spinal cord, and inject a high potency of this rather than formic acid in alternation with arnica. If you suspect, for instance, that the neurological disorder originates in the visual region, take the secretion from the quadrigeminal substance or some such substance from an animal, extract it and inject it in a fairly high potency to support the Arnica Montana. Let the support go to the place where it is needed. These things must always be observed. A mildly toxic effect will develop, especially if the Arnica Montana treatment proves successful. We do indeed want it to develop. It may be evident from something or other but you'll always find that this mildly toxic effect can be cancelled out with alkali compounds of some kind taken by mouth. I think that is what I have been saying, excuse me, I think that what I have been saying tells us something of great importance about what needs to be done with neurological disorders, including those of the spinal cord. These can only be diagnosed at the right stage, and we should get out of the bad medical habit so common, especially in Western Europe, of ascribing almost all forms of tabes dorsalis to some form of syphilitic causes. This is utter nonsense. Readers aside, I'm pronouncing T-A-B-E-S as tabes and then dorsalis. End of readers aside. And if you blinker yourself from the beginning, you will, of course, not see things as they are. The majority of spinal cord disorders do not have any kind of syphilitic origin, but arise from chills in the gastric and pelvic tracts, which people generally consider harmless, or from the spine being exposed to cold on some occasion. The situation is, of course, that due to social conditions over the last decades, the purely external complication would very frequently arise with both syphilis and spinal cord disorder, which distracts attention and people did not do the right thing, which is to combat the sequels of syphilis on their own and the sequels of spinal cord disorders with something of the kind I have just described. The interesting thing is that when you have located the neurological disorders as being still in the digestive tract or indeed the gastric tract, not going beyond the digestive organs, you can achieve the same result. And that is so extraordinarily interesting by using camomilla instead of arnica montana, again by injection. And apart from this, do the same. It is interesting because you can see from this, chamomile having practically no silica, that silica is only needed when you get beyond the digestive tract with the nerves. Silica is absent. On the other hand, the tract contains sulfur. And essentially this is particularly beneficial when you need to stimulate the ether body in the digestive system. Some more questions have come up, but we don't have time to go into them in detail. Quote, what is the nature of farsightedness and short-sightedness? Close quote. I know you mean to ask if these things can be treated. The origins are perfectly evident, and one doesn't inquire into them with things like this. You mean how one might influence them medically? It is possible to cure short-sightedness and far-sightedness and also take preventive action, for you are quite right. Glaucoma is very much connected with far-sightedness. People who are not far-sighted do not easily develop glaucoma. Medical treatment, which is certainly possible, will, however, only be successful if you initiate it perhaps even before the third year of life. So we have to notice the potential for short-sightedness or far-sightedness very early in children. You can do much then with belladonna in high potency, but you really have to spot it before the child has fully learned to talk and walk. 
Once the organism is physically established, as far as it is when the child has learned to walk, stand and talk, the whole tendency is there to give form to the crystalline lens and the vitreous body which is the basis for far and short-sightedness. And then it is difficult to do anything, for it is something purely mechanical and formal. On the other hand, for as long as the unformed principle in the infant's undirected movements, when arm movements and so on have as yet no orientation, influences the infant eye, E-Y-E, high potencies of belladonna induce a very inward sensing experience, a certain sentience, and so one might well think that something can be done at that point. But it probably won't be easy to make one's observations then. This is what one can say on the subject. I'm sorry, but we now have to come to a conclusion. I hope that we will be able to continue at a suitable time. It will always give us very particular satisfaction to be able to add something, as it were, to the medical program of the school, to be able to give something to the physicians when they come to such gatherings. I hope that this can happen again in the future in one way or uh, or another. Essentially, it will also be possible for friends who keep in touch with the school in Dornach to be given information on various things from time to time. We'll see to it that this is done in the right way. So if you send questions to Dr. Wegman, we will always answer them together, not of course in the supplement to title Das Gertianum, but in a form in which it will go to physicians only. I think we should arrange things so that if someone asks a question, the answer will reach all our anthroposophical physicians, for it is really always of interest to everyone. And this will be the best way forward for us. We'll try and also initiate communication with the physicians from here, in Dorna, in a suitable way. Now Dr. Palmer speaks. Esteemed Dr. Steiner, please permit me on behalf of my colleagues to express our heartfelt thanks that in spite of all the work you have to do, you have found the time to devote a few hours to us. Those of us who are working at the Institute for Clinical Medicine in Stuttgart are well aware of our great need for these sessions, and we would ask that you continue to give your support and advice. Give us your help. Dr. Steiner again. The only thing I would have liked to see would have been a a greater number of sessions. Thinking about it as much as we might, Dr. Wegman and myself, no more than these three sessions proved possible. As I said, I wish there could have been more sessions. Let us hope for another time. That is the end of Lecture 12 and the end of Part 3 of the uh, of the book, which was entitled Aspects of Therapy. Part 4 of the book is Hygiene as a Social Issue. End of Lecture 12.